This episode is brought to you by Pop Up Men's Events. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we really don't have much going on in the way of advertisers here. But actually, this is just a good way to, to pause to say, hey, I know a lot of you, especially if you may be a man, are saying, hey, I'd, I'd like to like hang out with Brian Tome someday. That'd be kind of good. Well, we're going to have a pop-up men event, maybe coming near you this spring. We're going to have an event in Nashville, Tennessee, we're going to have one in Texas. We're going to have one at Pikes Peak in Colorado. It's just a taste of man camp. It's a hyper, hyper scaled down version. It's just one night of camping. Good reason to get away from the normal grind of your life. Good reason to sit around a campfire and drink your favorite beverage and maybe have some laughs and, and maybe get to know some dudes or, or just have some time to just think on your own. There's going to be live music, teaching from yours truly, and all that stuff. And, and actually optional one night camping. You can choose to camp or not if you would like to. So how do you find out about that? Go to mancamp.us. Go to mancamp.us and I'd love to see you there. Welcome to the Aggressive Life you know, we've talked to a lot of aggressive people that are on the show, men and women. They're trying to push their lives forward instead of just passively waiting for something better to happen to them. And then there's this guy. Man, I love it. I feel like I always say that. And then there's this guy or then there's this woman, somebody who is a bit different. So that's what we got today. We got a guy by the name of David Wise. We're going to find out today exactly how wise he is, by the way. He started skiing at the age of three. He went pro at 18. And he's pretty freaking good at it, like Olympic, Olympic quality good. He's three-time Olympic medalist in freestyle skiing. That's a gold in 2014, a gold in 2018, and silver just a few months ago in Beijing. He's also won six X Game medals and won... FIS World Championship. I, I, I should know these things, Dave. What is FIS? Uh, that stands for Federación Internacional de Ski. That's the governing body for all Olympic ski, snow, ski, snowboard, cross country, Nordic, all. That's the governing body for all those events. All right, I thought it might be freaking intense skiing or something like that. All right, okay. <laughs> yeah, you can make up whatever action you want. <laughs> but wait, there's more. He's been an avid hunter since harvesting his first elk at the age of 12. He geeks out on providing food to sustain his family of four, including his wife and his two kids. And, and there's more. He's aggressively pushing himself into self-sufficiency. He's diving headfirst into sustainable living and agriculture on his tiny farm in Nevada. There his family not only hunts, but they raise chickens, pigs, and a swath of vegetables. And there's probably more, but I'm going to stop right now because I just want to talk to this aggressive <laughs> man. Fresh off the 22 Olympics, welcome to the aggressive life, David Wise. Thanks a lot, man. <laughs> wow. Man, Olympian. That's that's crazy. Like, h how long have you had as a goal to be an Olympian? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, <clears throat> I grew up watching the Olympics as a kid, and I always thought that would be cool. But somewhere along the way... When I got really into half pipe skiing in those early days, I mean, I'm the first ever Olympic gold medalist in half pipe skiing. So when I really dedicated myself to half pipe, it was kind of a way, in a way, giving up the Olympic dream because I didn't know that the half pipe was ever going to be an Olympic sport. We always hoped it would be, but it was never for sure. I don't know. I've kind of had a cool, I've had a really cool journey where I went from, you know, wanting to be an Olympic skier to actually loving half pipe skiing more than wanting to be an Olympian, wanting to be a professional half pipe skier competitor, and then being able to see it come full circle and be part of the athletes pushing the sport to get into the Olympics and then getting to go on the first team and then win the first medal, man, the whole journey has been just so baffling to me. Like you just set high goals and hope that it's going to work out. But when it does work out, you're almost, at least for me, I was kind of surprised like, wow, Really? <laughs> <laughs> the, the half pipe, I've seen it on, they might they don't show that one on TV, at least not much. I mean, I've seen the snowboard half pipe a bunch of times. 
I haven't seen the skiing half pipe. Do you feel like you're getting gypped off? Yeah, we do get a little less play than snowboard, and I don't know why. I guess people still think snowboarding's cooler, but I'm just, you know, out here steadily grinding, trying to convince people otherwise. I think back to the beginning of half pipe. Maybe you can tell me, like, who's the stupid... Who's the stupid owner of a ski resort that just said, hey, let's make a huge, massive half pipe out here and just see what happens? I mean, that, that had to be massively dangerous the first time that showed up anyplace. Well, when they were first built, they were like six feet tall. Let's take the skate park version of a mini ramp and put it on to make it out of snow. And that was the beginning of half pipe. They weren't very giant and very dangerous at first. And then they just kind of got competitive with each other, these, these big big money resorts and they would make, Oh, this guy built a 20 foot tall one. Oh, this resort built a 22 foot tall one. And now the competitive standard for us is that pipe's got to be 22 feet tall or else it can't host a world cup or X games or any of the high level events, which those 22 foot tall giant ice walls are super intimidating. I, when I watch that, I just think the balls it had to take to take your first run, Like, take us back to that, like, oh, skis, let's just go on a half pipe 15 feet in the air, and what could go wrong? What's that like the first time you go down? Well, the first time, you you don't go out of the pipe at all. You just go up the wall. Okay. And even that's intimidating. So that's what I recommend to anybody. If you go to a resort that has a half pipe, just go through it, because... If you can make a turn, you can go through the half pipe and it's very low risk. You can just go up up and down the walls, do some slalom turns and see how it feels. But I was a pretty aggressive little kid and I was very competitive. And I think the first time I ever skied the half pipe was a day that I happened to be skiing with the older kids. So they had a little competition of who could go the highest out of the pipe amongst themselves. So I just you know, went pedal to the metal and just launched myself into the flat bottom and <laughs> landed, landed so hard. I smoked my face on my knee and got a huge black eye, like full on ulcer on my face style black eye. And that was kind of my first experience with really trying to send it in that fight. So, you know, it's, it definitely beats you up. It's beat me up a few times over the years, but it's, it's been a pretty fun sport. There's a fine line when you're a kid of being aggressive or just being a flat out spaz. Yeah. Just being <laughs> reckless. Yeah. And I, I tiptoed that line for most of my life. Like, am I, am I aggressive and confident or am I just absolutely a loose cannon out here throwing myself around? And, uh, it kind of depended on which day you asked me or what asked the people around me, what, I, which, which version I was. What do you think that is? Do you think that was as a kid, you had a higher level of testosterone than the average kid? Or do you think that as a kid, you had opportunities to push yourself that a lot of kids don't have beyond their basement and Xboxes? I don't know. I always liked jumping and doing, you know, things that people saw as daring. I certainly got some positive feedback for being courageous as a young kid. Like people would dare me to do things and I'd be like, well, I'm not really scared to do the thing you're daring me to do that you're scared to do. So I would do it and then I'd get this positive feedback. So I, I definitely got some of that camaraderie or cultural feedback positively. But I think the main thing for me was that somewhere along the way, I've figured out that if I took something that scared me and then I did it, it didn't scare me anymore. And it was like this, it was like this victory that I had. So that's kind of been an obsession ever since for me It's like, well, I don't really need to fear anything. I just need to figure out why it scares me and, you know, kind of like pick it apart and and overcome it. Well, your parents must have marched to a different drummer. They're taking you at like three years old to do these things. They're, if they're not encouraging it, they're at least allowing it. I, most modern parents don't allow their kid to ride a tricycle in their basement without a helmet. Right. You know, so (laughs) what, what's your, parents mo tell me a little about them I, I like them i've never even met them they they had pretty open minds i think yeah and, and we were just an outdoor family i think the you know the fact that i was able to start skiing so young more than anything came from the fact that they were going to go skiing anyways so they might as well bring the three-year-old along and that's just how i grew up 
we grew up in Reno, Nevada, which is, you know, 45 minutes or an hour, depending on which resort you go to from some, some of the best skiing in the world in Tahoe. And every weekend, it was something I took for granted for sure as a kid, because I didn't realize how much of a sacrifice that was for somebody to drive us up skiing every single weekend and sometimes on Fridays. But yeah, it was just what we did. Um, some of the things I look back on developmentally, where my parents kind of gave me a loose enough leash that I could develop this action sports skill set is we had a, a trampoline in our backyard. My parents kind of let me just do whatever I wanted on that. Sometimes I would put the trampoline, my sister and I would put the trampoline under the tree and jump out of the tree onto the trampoline. And then I got to the point where I even jumped off the roof onto the, I mean, it's just a first story roof. So it wasn't like a huge drop, but it was pretty fun to jump off the roof onto the trampoline. They kind of just let me explore. They let me do whatever I wanted to do. They let me ride my bike around the neighborhood and play with my friends and just do whatever. So I don't think they ever intended me to be a professional action sports athlete, but they gave me enough freedom to figure out that that's what I wanted to do. And then they supported me when I made that decision. I think so many of us are just uh, so afraid of our kids getting hurt that they don't, we don't let them try to figure out their boundaries, you know? Yeah. In fact, I I remember uh, listening to uh, a guy speak years and years and years ago. His name was um, Stuart Brown is his name. He was the founder of the National Institute of Play. That's a great organization there. And he he studied all the people who were on death row. And he found that one of the things that all these guys had in common is a lack of rough play when they were kids. And his That's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. His his theory was that because they didn't have a lot of rough play as kids, they never got hurt, and so therefore they didn't know what it felt like and didn't develop an ability to empathize with somebody else being hurt. So therefore they could hurt somebody else. They had no, no understanding of how, how this must feel to them. Uh, I, I wonder if, if we're just losing a lot because we're just wrapping all of us in bubble wrap and outlawing things that used to be normal. Yeah. As a society, I think we're going too far away from danger. You can't learn to be calculated without taking a few risks and having a few losses along the way. And so, yeah, I let my kids shoot bows and, you know, throw hatchets at the stump to see if they can get the hatchet to stick in. And I let them cut their own, clean their own fish with their own knife and all that kind of stuff. And yeah they probably will cut themselves at some point with that knife. Hopefully not very badly. And I always just, every time I hand them the knife, I remind them the rules. Hey, don't cut towards yourself. Hey, don't, you know, don't stab aggressively towards your own body. (laughs) Don't cut towards (laughs) your buddy. Don't cut towards your sister. Don't cut towards yourself. Don't cut towards your mom. Don't cut towards me. Okay, here you go. I've, I've reminded you all the things. Now try it. And and then I do have to be willing to let them take that risk and potentially be injured or cut or, you know, and then we, if that happens, we figure it out. Your pedigree or your bio or your resume, whatever you want, it, it's got a lot of stuff that's kind of out there on it. Okay. We've got half pipes. <laughs> we've got half pipe skier. We've got Olympian dude who jumps off of roofs onto trampolines. We got guys, guy who gives sharp objects to his kids. Uh, and that's just the start of it. Are, are, is this something that has just always interests you? And so you do that, or is there a philosophy that you have behind it? Like a lot of people who are living the life you life, there's no philosophy. I'm just, this just seems fun and healthy. So I do it is, or is there something more, more philosophical for you? Yeah, I would say there's something more so philosophical for me. Um, I started out reckless and I started as an attention seeker and stumbled into this concept that courage is not the absence of fear. The absence of fear is recklessness, but the overcoming of fear is courage. And I think courage is one of the most valuable assets a human can have, especially in this crazy world with, with what we have going on right now. So I guess the the philosophy for me is that um, I learned how to build courage for myself 
and trust God that he was going to take care of the rest. And I want that for my kids. Wait a minute. Trust God. You're one of those people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's a, that's an essential piece of the puzzle there. Cause if you don't, if I don't trust, I don't know. Well, I, th- I think that that is something we haven't really talked a lot about that, should enable people of faith to be up for doing some risky things that somebody who doesn't have any faith probably isn't up for it because when you do believe in God, you believe there's a there's an X factor of power that you have in your life. You believe that there is a backstop. There may be a backstop there for you with your relationship with God. And even if there isn't, you believe that this life is very short relative to the next life. And so you're not as is freaked out about dying as an atheist or agnostic uh, may be. You agree or disagree with that? Absolutely. And that's a huge part of my parenting. People's response when I bring that topic up, when I say, hey, I believe in letting them try things and get in the dirt. A lot of people's response is, oh, I think that might be cool. But what if they die? Or what if the what if the worst case scenario happens? That's that's people's response all the time. Like, what if the worst possible thing that could go wrong in this situation does go wrong? And that's where, for me, it just comes down to trusting God and saying that he wants what's best for me. He wants what's best for my kids. If he allows worst case scenario to happen, then that just means that worst case scenario was the best thing for us in that moment. And it just gives us the freedom to not stress out about all of it. Yeah. Yeah. There's great freedom in that. That's good. Well, even your decision on your career path, you tell your dad, you're quote, going to go pro or die trying. It's a pretty bold statement. And (laughs) I just wonder how many, how many of us, if we took off the shackles, could have an incredible career ahead of us that, isn't the standard thing that many people go after. And for many of us, doing the standard thing is amazing and great, but we still need to be looking at those ways that we can kind of push our life forward instead of slotting into the rhythm that somebody else gave us. Yeah, I think when I was 18, just about to graduate high school, we went to our church, our home church at the time, and all the graduates stood up in front of the congregation. Um, I stood up and said, I'm not going to college. I'm going to be a professional skier. And the whole congregation laughed, like uh-huh. laughed as if I was telling a joke. And then there and then there was this awkward silence because they were like, oh, he's not joking. And now we have to decide what we think about that. And uh, so it's, you know, obviously it worked out for me. But part of the the fact that I was able to pull that off was just the, the courage to try. I didn't fear failure. I didn't fear failing to become a professional skier more than I feared not trying. I was like, I have to try. And part of that statement I said to my dad is, um, I'm not really a professional skier if I only, if I, if you're supporting everything that I do and then I make a little bit of money. Cause <laughs> to me, the definition of a professional athlete is somebody who actually makes money doing what they do beyond their expenses. They, net profit. So I was like, when I was 18, I was like, I was pretty motivated to see if I could pull it off. And so I was like, I'm not going to let you pay for any of my travel anymore. I'm going to see if I can make it as a professional. And I, I mean, I barely broke even that first year, but I did break even or slightly beyond even. And I was like, all right, uh, we can do this. Wow. So you were net profit at 19. Yeah. Wow. Dude, there, there's there's people who are 22 and aren't net profit and have been through college. That's that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, skiing's a young sport, though. It's uh, you kind of like a 22 year old is more like somebody in their early 30s in my sport because you can turn professional. I mean, some of my friends turned professional when they were 15, 16, and I'm art. I'm 31 now, and I was the second oldest guy in the entire field in half pipe in Beijing, the, the, the longer I keep doing this, the more I'm going to be this black sheep of somebody who's too old for the sport or so they say. Tell me about Beijing. What, what was it like there versus the other places you've, you've, um, competed? 
I mean, having been to three Olympics now, it's always the same. It's, it, it's, it's a weird thing to say, but it doesn't really matter where the host country is. There's some huge similarities that just kind of follow the Olympics around. Like there's the spirit of the games. There's the spirit of like athletic excellence that goes everywhere. So I've always, at each Olympics, I've had a very positive experience. I know there was a lot of negative press coming out from China, um, but that wasn't my experience at all. It was, it was awesome. Our accommodation, it was very, very cold there, which was no surprise. We knew that was going to be the case and it was the case. Um, but the food was fine. The, our accommodations were great. Uh, me and my friends just had a great time going to the Olympics. Um, but one thing that I tell people always about the Olympics is they always ask me how the country was like, how was China or how was Russia or how was Korea? And the reality is I don't really go to those countries when I go to the Olympics, because mm. we're, especially with COVID, we're in such an isolated bubble because that was really just at the Olympics for the most part. You ski with a camo infused jacket. Yeah, you're you're the only skier sponsored by a hunting brand. That's badassery. That's right. <laughs> when did you start hunting? So my old man decided that my sisters, that taking my sisters hunting. So I have twin sisters that are four years older than me. He decided taking them hunting would be kind of fun. So they, when they were twelve, when you can get your hunting license in Nevada. They got their hunting license, put in for deer tags, drew rifle deer tags. So that made me eight at that time. And I just tagged along and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. Um, And then obviously waited till I was 12 and could get a license of my own and went out and uh, got my first deer when I was 12 years old. And I've been hunting ever since. I didn't get really into hunting until after the Olympics in 2014, though. For me, hunting is an amazing way to just spend time with the creator, just get out. I kind of need solitude. I'm a little bit of an introvert naturally, so hunting is great for me. A um, good friend of mine gave me a bow, one of his old bows. He's like, dude, you got too much going on in your life, too many media requests, too much attention. You need to sh- start shooting archery. It's really relaxing. It's good for the mind. It's good for the body. It's good for your focus. It's kind of meditative. And so he gave me his old bow and I started shooting and I just fell in love with the, the, the task of shooting archery. And that's when I got really into hunting because now I like added an X factor of difficulty to the hunt but I was also able to draw more tags and spend more time out in the field. And, um, the archery seasons are a little bit more ideal time for a professional skier. (laughs) So it's grown pretty massively over the last couple of years. Now I'm putting it in all the Western States, hunting California, Nevada, Utah, Idaho, Wyoming, you know, whenever I can. And then I'll put in, I'll, I'll add in a couple days of hunting to a ski trip nowadays. And it's just, it's, it's kind of gotten out of hand. My wife would probably tell you. Did you get any draws this last year? For those who don't know, uh, yeah. For those who go, don't know, th- th- some of you are hunters. Uh, you know, you hunt whitetail. If you're in the state that you're in, you yeah, you know, fine. You go 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 get a tag. Everyone's in the state you're in with deer. At least that's all the states that I know. But when you start talking about elk and that kind of thing, and if you don't live in that state, your likelihood of ever getting into it to hunt elk is very, very low unless you do what I do, go to Colorado and do an over-the-counter tag, which are in units that aren't desirable and stuff like that. So I put in for, I don't know, two states last year, three states. I I didn't get any, so I just did the OTC in Colorado. Are you actually landing different states? Oh, no. Most of the the out-of-state hunting I do is the same that you do in Colorado, just over-the-counter. A lot lot of these western states have some kind of an over-the-counter tag. So... If I don't draw any elk tags, then I, I generally go pick a state and try to hunt over the counter because elk is my favorite meat. Um, I was actually fortunate, though. I drew a, a Utah limited entry mule deer tag last year, which was an amazing experience. That was super cool. Uh, so Did you I didn't one? draw any elk tags. Yeah, I got I, I got a deer in Nevada, a mule deer in Nevada, and then I, got, I filled that Utah mule deer tag. So two deer for the family, which was just about enough. And then I'm got a couple of wild hogs to kind of you know keep the freezer looking i always get a little freezer tension freezer stress when it gets low so uh, freezer's still looking good right now okay so you're one of those guys that 
your goal is when you're home and you're eating, you're eating something that you shot. Yeah. yeah not even when I'm home I, anymore. I take, unless I'm traveling internationally where it's not legal, I'll, I will take a Yeti cooler full of wild game meat everywhere I go pretty much. Wow. Well, give us your favorite recipe. I really like doing, especially when I'm skiing, like if I'm cooking, if I'm cooking something up for the team, cause I, I spend a lot of time cooking wild game for the team, uh, as we're traveling. So I like to take the shanks, which is like the, um, foreleg, the front leg bone <laughs> below the elbow <laughs> to the hoof. I like to take that and slow cook them all day long with like potatoes and garlic and onions and carrots and I'll throw in some of our own like bone broth that we've done from when we uh, process a, an animal and just leave it in the pot all day long. And then you get home from skiing and the whole house, the whole condo or wherever we're staying smells delicious. And then everybody just gets excited and we all sit down and eat. That's my favorite thing to do. So you're not smoking it. You're actually slow simmering it in water on the, on the stove. Yeah, on the stove or if they have a crock pot, if they happen to have a crock pot at whatever Airbnb we're staying at or, or whatever, you kind of got to, you got to be good at freestyling your meals when you travel a lot because you never know what, what the place you're staying is going to have. So is it true that you lost sponsors when you quote unquote came out as a hunter? Uh, yeah, that's, that is a hundred percent true. I, I always tell people, I'm like, well, it was really kind of a net, it was kind of a wash. Like I gained some sponsors from the hunting side when I lost some sponsors who didn't want to associate with a hunter, but I feel like I, if anything, I, I benefited. I don't count it as a net loss. I count it as a net gain because I was able to be more authentically myself and not to stress so much about like, Oh, I can talk about this in this place, but I can't talk about it in that place. It's just like, dude, it's too much mental gymnastics for me. I just want to be genuinely me. So I happen to think that hunting is a great lifestyle and it's an awesome way to provide food for your family. And I wanted to be able to talk about it. So give me one sponsor that dropped you. Uh, I can't do that. Why not? <laughs> because I have some, yeah, I would, I would probably get legally in trouble. You would? Okay. 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 All right. Fine. Fine. Weenie boy. Just, just, <laughs> fine. Just, just, just take the passive, know. just take the passive I move. Not, but I'd rather not take that. Okay. Risk. All right. So I, let me ask you this. So let's just say it's, uh, whatever, uh, to some, some, some brand and, and they drop you. How much of it is there is an executive that has a conviction against meat and how much it is they just fear the backlash from everybody else who doesn't understand hunting? I think it's probably the, the backlash fear, but you know, the reality is too, and that's part of why I don't want to name these companies because I can't tell you for sure, for sure that they, like, they didn't ever send me an email saying we are dropping you because you're openly a hunter, but there's just a feeling that you get. And it's like, Oh no, I'm pretty sure that you guys, you guys have made some comments in the past that were like, Oh, you should definitely never post about this hunting thing that you do. But the, 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 the reality is that some of those companies might've disliked me just as much for the fact that I'm openly, that I'm open about my faith. And I tell people that I trust God to take care of me and my family. And there's a lot of things that make me different and hunting's not the only one. So I can't, I guess I can't pin it down for exactly why those companies dropped me, but some, but some of them, it was, it was fairly obvious to me and my agent, like, Oh yeah, that was, that was probably why. Yeah. Well, you're a farmer though. You're kind of working the land. That's pretty pol politically correct. How's that going for you? I guess I discovered that I'm better at killing things than keeping them alive, which <laughs> is kind of sad because I think that every farmer wants to be better at keeping things alive than they are at killing things. But the hunter in me, I am really good at killing, killing meat for, to feed my family. But man, we went, when, when we first started our little tiny farm, we kind of started it during the very beginning of COVID on. And we had chickens get killed by everything in, in our little neighborhood here, like raccoons and foxes and bears and mountain lions. Man, I was like, I really felt like I was just feeding predators around here for a long time. <laughs> like buy the chickens, raise them up to about five weeks and then they're dead. They're all dead. And so it was, it was kind of a long, slow 
brutal learning process, but now the chickens are secure. I think it's been over a year now since we've had a, a predation on the chickens, but the same kind of goes to, for my garden box because I just learned the hard way that we have so many, like we have a lot of deer and stuff that live in my neighborhood and they like to eat all my plants. Everything that I think is delicious, they think is delicious too. So we pretty much made a successful like five salads last year in terms of growing our own vegetables. <laughs> so oh, it's more of a dream than a reality at this point, but we'll get there. Do you have a dog? Uh, two dogs. You do? And you let them outside? Yeah. Yeah, because I well, we had a lot of deer issues around my around my house, and I just always read oh, a dog will help. And I thought I'm not going to chain my dog out there. But whenever we see a deer, we let our dog out, and she just chases them, just runs after them. And what do you know? They they've stopped coming around. Yeah, I wouldn't say I was the driving force behind the dogs that we ended up with because it was purely my daughter's decision. Because she saved up her own money, and she was like, "Hey, I want a dog." And I want this kind of dog. And so she wanted a Yorkie poops. Oh, well, that explains it. You don't, uh, you don't have a dog. That's explained. I thought you had like a no, dog. No, we have dog. a rat. We no, have a rat right. with, with, no. with canine qualities. Get, yeah. Make an aggressive move and get yourself a real dog and your predator <laughs> problem will go away. What are you doing in Yorkshire? True. You don't get I got manly men who hunt and ski. They don't, they don't have Yorkshires, Yorkie, Chihuahua dogs in their house. Come on, man. You're off brand. I mean, it's, you know, that's, that's my, that is my brand. I'm willing to be off brand whenever I feel like it. Oh, there you go. Well, you're, let's talk about your family here for a little bit. Um, we don't really have a, a point like, Hey, here's the six points that we can learn from David Wise, but this is a, <laughs> you're sort of a, uh, you're a Renaissance man and that you're marching to the beat of a different drummer. And and that drummer by your own words is God. He's he's the drummer, but that beat is also leading you to do things and make decisions that other people don't like. Have a family and get married at twenty one years of age. That's that's very countercultural today. Oh yeah. Why did you do that? Why wouldn't you wait until you know sow your wild oats, have a good time, and ma ma maybe settle down around thirty thirty one? Honestly, I don't know. I I guess I always thought that I would not get married till a little later but i always wanted to be a dad and i always wanted to be a husband and i think mm -hmm. that a lot of people can can relate to that it's like i didn't i didn't know when or how i was going to be that those things but um i definitely always wanted that and even as i was you know becoming a young adult and and traveling and competing and i was always just praying for god to send me somebody that was like could be like a partner could be my the yin to my yang or whatever and i just expected him to give that to me when i was in my 30s i i didn't i didn't ever intend or anticipate being married young but god had a different plan for me and he just sent me the right girl at a young age so i think getting married to the right person is the most important getting married to somebody who you know for me the biggest thing was that my wife was just as motivated to follow Christ wholeheartedly with her whole life as I was. And that's been our building block from the, from day one. That's part of my story that still surprises me. If you had told young, like 15 year old version of David that I was going to have a child before I ever had my first X games gold medal, I would have told you you were crazy. Wow. But that's the way God wrote my story. But the cool thing about that for me is that I was militant. I was dedicated. I was like so just motivated to be the best skier I could possibly be that I tended to overpressure myself. I had like this mental, um, I would just crumple mentally in competition before I got married and before my daughter was born. And it was like a lot of years of being at or near the cutting edge skills wise, but far off the mark in competition. And so I'm trying to be a professional skier in as a competitive half pipe skier. I kind of need to land a competitive run once in a while to do that. And I would, I mean, it, for like from age 15 to age 18, 19, I would basically do it like once or twice a season where I like landed a good run just enough to keep myself in it. You know, then I got married because I 
like my wife and I, from, from like two weeks in, we kind of knew we were going to get married. We were like, yeah, I just don't see my, I don't know. <laughs> Looking back, we were so, we were so naive about it, but I was just like, man, I don't think I'm going to find anybody better than this. Like you are awesome. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. I was, I was convinced very young, <laughs> very early. Would you call your soulmate? Oh man, that, I could go into the weeds with that one. Cause I don't know if I believe in the whole one person for each person mentality about marriage, because I think that that's kind of a fantasy yeah, man. when people are like, Oh, you found your soulmate. You're just so lucky. And the reality is we just have worked hard at staying together. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I would say she is my soulmate, but I don't know that it's like, it's not like we were two pieces of a puzzle that fit perfectly together and we didn't ever have to try. It was just that we trusted that God was going to have our back and we just been growing towards each other ever since. And I think that, I mean, our faith has been a massive help in our relationship because if, if I'm truly pursuing Christ and trying to become more like him, you know, obviously I'm going to fail at that along the way, but if I'm trying to do that, and she's trying to do that. I'm naturally going to like who she becomes more and more the closer that she gets to the creator. So I, I, that's one of the things that I'm just so thankful for looking back on having gotten married so young. It's like, wow, she she really is totally different from who uh, she was when I met her, but in a good way. And that has just you know been an amazing part of our story. Yeah, Lib and I have become soulmates uh, and I'm not, I couldn't even say exactly when it was, but here's what I know. It's a lot more recent than people would believe. And we, yeah, and we definitely weren't, and we definitely weren't when we got married. It was, it was a calculated decision of, oh, uh, this one could work. This, I could see my life being better here. Yeah. There's, mm. there's enough here and boom, took off. It was wonderful, but that's, that's uh, just kind of not the way it is with many people today. So I meet someone like you. I'm like, oh man, you're dude. You're like you're like old school, real old school. I got married and I had a daughter, and I it was like my eyes were open. I realized, wow, life is about a lot more than this game I play on a pair of skis because that's all I cared about. It literally was all I cared about. And then my daughter was born, and I realized, wow, there's a lot more to this than what I thought. And actually the thing that I care the most about doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter nearly as much as I thought it did. And these two people, these two humans, it was just a way for my perspective to change because these two humans, my wife and my daughter became the most important thing to me and um, kind of gave me the freedom to like not pressure myself so much about success. And I realized at the end of the day, they were going to love me no matter what I did. And I stopped putting my identity in success on skis. And all of a sudden I just started winning contests because mm. I was not pressuring myself anymore. I was just enjoying the ride. Wow. That, that's fantastic. Where do you go from here, David? Uh, you know, you're going you're gonna to age out here of the skiing competition. What, uh, what's, what's a long-term plan that you have for your life? Do you have one? <laughs> Uh, it's more, I guess the question is more, where don't I go than where do I go? I've, I've, I just lost my fear of failure a long time ago. So now I just look at my life ahead of me and I look at my kids and what they're excited about. And I'm like, yeah, what, let's do it. Let's do, let's do what we want to do. Not what society tells us we should do. So, um, I would love to go to the Olympic games for archery. Uh, I want to try to pull that off in 2028 because it's in LA and I think it'd be cool to compete in the summer games on home soil. That's one of my, one of my outlandish goals I have. Um, I have a mentorship program I started called mental giants where I just, uh, kind of talk about some of the things that we've been talking about with young up and coming athletes who struggle the same way I used to uh, with just the mental side. So, you know, I kind of do that motivational stuff and just try to try to take my story that God's given me and use it to benefit other people instead of just using it to benefit myself. So I, I mean, like I said, where, where do I not want to go? 
I want to spend a lot more time hunting and fishing. Um, I want to have more animals, you know, get the farm bigger and bigger. And, you know, it just, I, I want to do a lot of things. You say, quote, moving forward to me should be a perpetual state of existence. Explain that. Yeah, it's like this philosophy that I've embraced where um, I'm trying to stay uncomfortable almost because I have noticed just through observation that comfortability is one of the most dangerous things we have in our society today. If you get too comfortable, you are at the greatest risk for not living a dynamic life. And so I, I constantly want to be challenging myself. I want to be doing new things. I don't want to just get into a rhythm and never get out of that rhythm. Because if you, if you kind of, I don't know, if you, if you zone out and just get into a rhythm, you might end up somewhere that you didn't anticipate ending up. And I don't want to do that. So I, I just want to constantly be adjusting and, and trying new things. If I'm not learning something new and keeping my creative brain firing, then I just get bored. One more quote I want you to go off on here, and then we're going to do the lightning round. I think you're a guy who could probably handle the lightning round. I think you're a guy who could think very Hopefully. fast we'll on your feet and give really great answers. But... I want to just give you one more here because it's. I think it's really, really fresh. Final quote for you. Skiing for me has always been my act of worship to God. I worship the creator by doing what I was created to do. He gave me the talent and opportunities, so I'm going to go out there and use everyone as an act of worship. That's great stuff. For a lot of folks, that's, wait, well, I thought worship when you stood and sang in church. Talk more about that. Yeah, I think we were designed... As humans, we were designed to worship the creator in all things. And I think that's where we've maybe gotten off the mark a little bit in, in terms of worship. Um, because God gave us all these talents and all these opportunities, all these assets, and he wants us to glorify him with those things. And that was a huge part of that mental breakthrough I was describing earlier that I made. And when I started winning competitions and and landing runs and doing well was partly because I just realized that I didn't have to do it. I got to do it. It was like, I had this, I have to win this contest mentality because I want people's acceptance or I want success or whatever. And then it's, I realized it was kind of in a, it was a kind of a spiritual and mental transition where I realized, no, I, God gave me the, these skis. He gave me the ability to ski. He gave me parents who would support my ski career. All of these things that I have are gifts from the King of Kings. And he wants me to just go out there and do it for him. So I stopped skiing for the judges. I stopped skiing to, to try to beat my competitors. It, in some sense, I almost even stopped skiing just for myself because th there's one mentality that like, oh, if you just ski for yourself, you might be successful. I started skiing for the creator. I was like, my and my creative process became a lot more like, God, what do you think I should do? Like, what tricks was nobody else doing that you think I could do? You're the one who designed snow. And I know you designed these plastics that they make skis out of that slide on snow really well. So what do you think? And it became this creative process so much more. And I almost like became more of an artist. But I kind of believe growing up that God just made me as an athlete. He just made me a guy who liked to run around fast and jump off things and uh, that, I, that I didn't have an artistic side. And um, through this process of learning to worship on skis and, and worship with my everyday life, God showed me, you know, you're an artist. You just paint with a different brush. Man, that's really fresh. And that, that's just really good for me, for me to hear, you know, my, my day job as a pastor. And I got to tell you, me and a lot of my colleagues from all over the place uh, can tip over from, Hey, I'm here to worship God by giving him the best message I can give or by giving him the best mission trip that can be designed by giving him whatever it is, we can tip really easy over into what are the metrics that we need to hit as a church? What do I need to do that, mm -hmm. that the people are going to respond really well to? If, if, I'm, if I'm saying, what do I need to do that people are going to respond real well to? That, that's the same thing as you saying, what am I going to do that the judges are going to like? 
But yeah. you're saying, no, uh, God is my judge. I'm just going to do something to honor him and worship him, and, and we'll see what happens with the judges. That's a really fresh thing, no matter what our job is, whatever, whatever our occupation is. All of us can do that. Are we are we balancing the books as a CPA because we're staying within code? Are we balancing the books because God likes order and we want to worship him? Mm-hmm. Amen. That's fresh. Well, what do you know? This is good, man. I need a little tweak like that today. Are you ready? Are you ready for the are you ready for the lightning round, David Wise? This happens. I, hope so. I give you a real quick topic and you got a bam like lightning. You gotta okay. answer it real fast. All right. So I, I know you ready. have a problem with speed. I know you have a problem with that. You like to just kind of meander along and not really do things quickly because you like slow things, but uh, I, I bet you can do it. Here we go. The All worst right, accident you've ever had. Shattering my femur. Doing something dumb. Very good. You obeyed the <laughs> rules of the lightning round. Well done. Now I get to break the rules. You got to tell me more about that. What happened? Uh, I was at a film and photo event called Audi Nines, and I was uh, the whole concept of the event is they build these very picturesque looking, uh, futuristic, like almost space creations out of snow. You jump, and there's quarter pipes and do cool tricks. They film it and we put out cool videos. Um, it was the last day, which is always a dangerous place. And I just was like, oh, I want to try to jump from this takeoff to this landing. I think that would look cool. And then on the next run, I'll do a cool trick there. So I was even, it was on the warm up run. And I just didn't make it to the landing that I thought I was going to make it to and just completely folded my femur bone oh. over this oh. ice wall that I was trying to jump over oh. and it was gnarly. Oh. Yeah. Broke, broke into three different pieces. Oh. It was all sharp. My muscles were all torn up. It was, it was gross. Not, I didn't have the bone sticking out of my leg. That's one of, one of people's first questions. Oh. Luckily, no bone was still inside, but it was pretty brutal. Dag. What, what was your recovery like with that? Uh, it was like, a, it was like a 18 month recovery because I, I mean, it's a big bone, but I did so much muscle damage in there. And then, you know, they had to put a rod through the, through the bone. And when they put the rod in, they had cut through some muscle to get it in. And man, it, it was like, I was walking. I basically walked out of the hospital, which is weird when you have a, have had such a traumatic bone break, but they put a rod in there and you can pretty much walk on it. So it was a quick recovery in terms of how fast the bone healed. I mean, it was like eight weeks later, the bone is fairly solid, but the muscle and nerve damage and even just retraining my brain to be confident again, uh, that took like 18 months. It was, it was long. It was a long process. So you're hundred percent right now. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. The secret to staying upright when skiing. Balance and effective use of gravity. Well, what's that mean? Effective use of gravity. Well, if you think about it, you know, gravity is what keeps you upright. If you tip over to the left and you're, and you don't carve your skis along with you, then you're going to tip over. But if you use gravity well and, and push against gravity, if you will, while you're in the turn, then you nailed it. Secret to a successful hunting expedition. High hopes and low expectations. <laughs> Favorite food you're raising or growing on your tiny farm? Currently, farm fresh eggs every day. Biggest aggressive mistake you've made and what you're learning from it? I've started a lot of brands or companies or done a lot of business endeavors that were undercooked. I kind of treated them like skiing, like, oh, well, I'll just try it for the first time and see how it works out. And uh, it never has. So I'm definitely a little bit more calculated business-wise anymore. The best thing you're doing to build your family? Spending time with them. Dude, this has been great. Is there anything you want to talk about that we haven't talked about or I haven't asked you? Good question. I think... uh... I don't know. Maybe I'll just give a plug for all the places where they can follow the different things people might be yeah, interested in. Yeah, please. Uh, so if you're interested in my uh, hunting, farming style stuff, it, there's a separate Instagram page called Wise OTG. Um, my skiing Instagram is at Mr. David Wise. 
Um, YouTube channel is same thing. They're all Mr. David Wise. So youtube.com slash Mr. David Wise. My website is Mr. David Wise.com. And that's the, that's the best way you can keep up with the Wise family and what we got going on. David, really invigorating to be with you today. I learned a lot myself. I think uh, a lot of people have been built into. So thanks for doing what you're doing and marching to the drummer you're marching to and giving us a glimpse of what uh, an aggressive life looks like when you're submitted to, to God. Well done, brother. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks for having me on. All right, there you go. I don't know what you're going to do from this. Some, some of you, I don't know, I guess take up skiing. I don't know, maybe you'll take up skiing. You take up hunting, you take up farming. You can actually marry that, that person you've been dating forever. Maybe that's what it is. You're gonna, are you going to let your kids ride a tricycle without a helmet? I don't know what you could do, but I hope you got something out of this. You can apply to your life. That's why we do this. It's not about just meeting interesting people. It's about giving you something to take hold of your life and make it better. We'll see you next time on The Aggressive Life. Hey, thanks for listening. For all things aggressive living, why don't you head over to bryantome.com. Find my new book, Move, a guide to get up and go forward, as well as articles and much, much more. And no matter where you listen to podcasts, why don't you take a second and leave us a rating, leave us a review. It really, really helps us drive new listeners to the show. We want to help as many people as possible, just like we may have helped you. We want to help others. So why don't you help us out? And if you want to connect, find me on Instagram at Brian Tome. Aggressive Life with Brian Tome is a production of Crossroads Church, Cincinnati, Ohio.